Welcome back everybody, I'm Jake the Scary Story Guy and today we are diving deep into Ari Aster's second feature film, Midsummer. Now last week I reviewed Aster's debut film, Hereditary. Actually, I stopped filming about five minutes ago, but I'm posting it a week later because I am on vacation right now. And by right now, of course, I mean in the future when I schedule this video to be published and when you are watching it. Okay, so I just barely watched both Hereditary and Midsummer in the same weekend, which is a fairly unique emotional cocktail. And to be honest, I'm having a lot of trouble deciding which of the two movies I like more. If you watched my review for Hereditary, you'll know that I actually did not like it on first viewing, but that over time it has grown to become my favorite film from 2018. Midsummer, by contrast, I absolutely loved the first time I saw it, right? And I still love it. It's just that this was a movie that was immediately accessible to me while Hereditary was not. And I think that's almost entirely due to the fact that I sort of like matured as a movie watcher from the time I first saw Hereditary to the time I saw Midsummer. And that's not to say I'm some highfalutin film expert now or whatever. It's just that that in-between period was actually a period in my life where I really made an attempt to broaden my horizons as far as what types of movie I could find compelling. And it's a good thing I did, because Midsummer is every bit as, as f***ed up and weird as Hereditary, maybe even more so. I've got to be honest, it's making me like borderline apprehensive for Astor's third movie, Bo is Afraid, coming to theaters next month. Like, how is he gonna top this? It is three hours long and stars Joaquin Phoenix, so I guess that's a good start. Okay, so Midsummer stars Florence Pugh as Danny, a girl who goes on a trip to Sweden with a bunch of her college friends. One of the friends grew up in this, it's like part commune, part cult out there in Sweden, so he invites his homies to, to come stay there with him. One of them's gonna do like a research project out there. And things gradually get so sinister and, and psychedelic and weird out in Sweden that one might actually forget about the utterly horrific opening scene to this movie. And we might as well start there. The opening scene in this movie, I won't give any spoilers, it is not for the faint of heart. It's not even like gory or brutal, it's just... We get some really impressive and, and visceral acting from Florence Pugh right off the bat that it feels like the movie going equivalent of getting punched in the stomach just to watch it. And from this opening scene on, we learn that Danny is, is a very insecure, fairly neurotic person. She's not your typical horror movie protagonist at all. She's in a long-term relationship with this guy, Christian, and neither of them are happy in the relationship, but they're both too codependent to leave, so they just settle for making each other miserable for years. And this doomed relationship is really one of the thematic through lines of the movie. Like, what, what should we depend on others for, right? And and what are we justified in doing if we feel like those needs aren't being met? There's a lot of commentary on the internet about what a shitty boyfriend Christian is, and don't get me wrong, he is a supremely shitty boyfriend, but like, I'm not sure Florence Pugh is, is winning any Girlfriend of the Year awards here. There's this kind of narrative on the internet that this is some hyper-feminist, like, slay queen type of movie. I think that's a misguided read of things. But Midsummer is definitely a movie that spawned discourse, and I mean that in the most annoying possible sense of the term. 2019 was kind of the heyday Day of critics being more concerned with whether a movie was socially progressive than whether it was actually a good movie. And a lot of the negative reviews of Midsummer kind of took that angle with it. The New York Times review, for instance, chose to complain that Danny and Christian's relationship was, quote, stereotypically gendered. What? You mean like most relationships? You know, Midsummer was fine, but the guy acted like a guy and the girl acted like a girl. Yikes. Not a great look. It's 2019. Educate yourself. Do better. Did I miss any? Not to be out virtue signaled, Richard Brody of The New Yorker concluded that the film was regressive. He called it that twice because its ultimate message was, quote, lucky Americans stay home. How do you possibly come away from this movie thinking that's the message, or even a message? I'm sorry, I just have to go off on this really quick. Richard Brody writes the kind of shit that is just perfect for the readership of The New Yorker, because it's totally inane, but he... people think he's brilliant, because he uses a sneering tone and throws around words like lugubriously. My personal favorite Richard Brody take is when he called A Quiet Place a problematic and conservative film because it depicted a family of white people defending themselves with guns against hulking dark monsters which he chose to paint as a representation of middle America defending itself against black people. And I will say, at a certain level, you've actually gotta be kinda smart to come up with something that stupid. Okay, back to Midsummer. Something that's really unique about this movie and the fact that it's set in Sweden is that, like, the sun never sets there. So it's daylight, like, all the time. I don't think I've ever seen that in a horror movie before. I mean, usually these movies are relying on darkness and shadow to do a lot of the heavy lifting for them, you know, scaring people-wise. But in Midsummer, it, it's doing the exact opposite 
opposite. There is a constant bright light being shown on every single horrifying thing that happens here. There's also a really psychedelic feel to this movie. They actually do use mind-altering substances in a couple of scenes, and it's just portrayed in such an unsettling way. It's the best film representation I've ever seen of a bad trip, where it's like, all the, the ingredients of, of regular life are there, but it doesn't quite feel like home anymore. It's like there's this hazy, sinister undertone to everything. You feel like things are all out to get you. And Aster manages to capture that through just like a few bare bones camera tricks and digital effects. It's, it's super impressive. The cast is really solid too. We've got uh, Chidi from The Good Place. We've got this guy who looks and acts remarkably like the Parks and Rec version of Chris Pratt. We've got Eyebrows Kid. Eyebrows Kid? His name's Will Poulter. I've known him as Eyebrows Kid ever since I saw him in that Narnia movie forever ago. He's a total asshole in this, by the way. I'm pretty sure he's contractually obligated to be in like every movie he appears in. I mean, just look at his face. You are never casting this kid as your protagonist. He is 100% of people who look like this are assholes. And above all, Florence Pugh really carries the hell out of this movie. It's one of the best horror performances I've seen in a long time. It's not quite Tony Collette in Hereditary, but then again, what is? It's interesting because this is around the time where she was really breaking out as like a, a super hot star, an A-plus list actress, the, the kind of person who could really just get any gig she wanted. And a lot of times when an actor is at that place in their career, they want to play it safe, right? They, they want to be Spider-Man. They want to be heroic and strong and, and easy to love and easy to spend time with. And Florence Pugh isn't particularly any of those things in this movie. She's got to really be vulnerable in a way that I think a lot of young actors of her stature would be uncomfortable with. With. Because subtly, I think that, that characters can negatively impact your perception of an actor. I think the, the actors who played uh, Joffrey Baratheon, Draco Malfoy, have talked about this before. But personally, I found both Danny and even Christian to be sort of sympathetic characters in this just because they're so human and selfish and flawed. Like, they, they seem real. This movie does not work if Danny is some, like, boss bitch who's just great at standing up for herself. Because as Midsummer starts to spiral, right, the events in this movie and in this, in this community are becoming more and more sinister, you as the viewer are just feeling like you're kind of carried helplessly along because you know these characters aren't getting out of this. They can't get themselves out of a shitty relationship. What makes you think they're going to get themselves out of a life and death situation? And to me, it's watching Christian and Danny be sort of impotently swept up in all this fervor, watching these horrible things happen to them and, and around them and, and not doing anything about it that constitutes the true horror of Midsummer. When I first saw this, I was too captured by like the total depravity and the, the spectacle of things that are going on to really think too deeply about the themes. But on rewatch, I think this is this is not a movie about like, oh, look how other cultures do things. Aren't they nuts? Or, or maybe they've got a point. It's an examination of how we do things, how, how conflict avoidant we are, how, how codependent we are, how, how desperate we are, and how bitter and vindictive we can be when all our protective layers have been stripped away. And just like Hereditary before it, Midsummer is an utter masterclass, not just in filmmaking, but in, in the creation of horror from our guy, Ari Aster. And I am going to give Midsummer five stars out of five. Okay guys, that about does it for my thoughts here, but if you have any suggestions for future books, movies I review, please leave those in the comments below. And in the meantime, thank you for watching this video, and here's hoping you survive to see the next one.